lecture, which is actually the introduction to this series on Totem and Taboo, Freud Was Right. This will be an introduction, and the next four lectures will uh, follow. In a previous series of three lectures entitled Freud's Anthropological Theory, I covered in detail Freud's Totem and Taboo, which was the most essential anthropological statement in his collected works. I would refer anyone who is interested in a more detailed discussion of Totem and Taboo and the relation of Freud's anthropology to his psychological concepts to those lectures on the Carter Jenkins Center's website. This present lecture continues from that series and begins to address the impact of Freud's anthropology following the publication of Totem and Taboo in 1913. My emphasis here will be on the debates it stimulated between anthropology and psychoanalysis and within psychoanalysis up to the present day. On the relationship between psychoanalysis and anthropology. By mid-20th century, it was much easier to find literature on the role of psychoanalysis in anthropology than vice versa. It's probably true to say that in the exchange of ideas between the two disciplines, psychoanalysis for most of the 20th century had the more profound impact. Anthropology, perhaps more than any other field of science outside of psychology, was especially quick to assimilate Freud's strictly psychological theories. For example, his formulations on unconscious motivation, dream symbolism, incest motivations, and the significance of childhood on adult personality, these concept, the concepts have all become mainstream in anthropological discourse by now. But the discipline of anthropology had nearly the opposite reaction to the specifically anthropological and, and evolutionary formulations that Freud asserted in Totem and Taboo. It largely rejected them and did so quite passionately. The subsequent debates between the two disciplines over Freud's anthropological theories, following the first English translation of Totem and Taboo in 1918, became intense and continue to this day. It's to these controversial anthropological theories of Freud's as opposed to his psychological theories that the title of this lecture series refers. Freud's Controversial Conclusions Following the present introductory lecture, I've divided my argument on behalf of Freud's anthropology into four parts, each of which will be covered, as I said, in a separate lecture. These include Lecture 1 on the universality of the Oedipus complex, Lecture 2 on Freud's theory of the primal horde, Lecture 3 on Freud's adherence to Lamarckian factors in evolution, and Lecture 4 on Freud's cultural evolutionary approach. For the remainder of this introduction, I want to anticipate briefly in summary fashion the ground I'll cover in each of the next four lectures and provide some context uh, for them on the history of the debates over the last hundred years since Freud published Totem and Taboo. We're just past the centennial of Totem and Taboo by three years now. Okay, so Lecture 1, uh, a brief summary of Lecture 1. The Oedipus Complex, Lecture 1 is the uh, universality of the Oedipus Complex. The Oedipus Complex, just as Freud formulated it, is universal across cultures. It is largely a function of human biology and infant dependency, and contrary to popular accusations of ethnocentrism, it has nothing special to do with Western patriarchal or patrilineal societies. Unfortunately, even as many within anthropology have come to recognize the validity of Freud's claim, it has only become more devalued within psychoanalysis. Contemporary psychoanalysis, I will argue and will be arguing in the first lecture, minimizes the Oedipus complex at 
the expense of its own legitimacy and at the expense of its own clinical effectiveness. But what does all this mean to say that the Oedipus complex is universal? For the purposes of this brief summary, I will use terms relating mainly to the heterosexual or positive Oedipus complex, the positive dimension of the male Oedipus complex in particular, as this was Freud's um, primary focus in Totem and Taboo and his thesis there. Of course, the Oedipus complex applies equally to uh, male and female psychosexual development. Freud discovered the Oedipus complex long before he wrote Totem and Taboo. It began to take shape during his self-analysis between 1895 and 1900, and he referred to the concept already in the interpretation of dreams in 1900. However, in Totem and Taboo, Freud defined the Oedipus complex in the fullest anthropological terms as a universal feature of childhood. With this concept, Freud defined the ambivalent and specifically triangular conflicts that emerge in the feelings of a three to five year old boy in which gently felt phallic sexual desire and corresponding fantasies for the mothering figure, most often the biological mother in all cultures, predominate, along with murderous fantasies and jealous comparisons in relation to the mother's sexual partner, again, predominantly the father, the biological father in all cultures. The emergence of these feelings in early childhood trigger intense anxieties and distortions in the child's perceptions of himself and the parents, due mainly to a belief in the omnipotence of ideas on the part of the child, and a tendency to project the Oedipal fantasies onto the parents. Guilt and fears of castration follow from the boy's expectation of the father's attack on the part of his body most associated with his unacceptable sexual wishes. Freud's theory posited that the successful resolution of the Oedipus complex is partially determined by inherited factors and follows the boy's internalizing uh, uh, identification with the father's values which, uh, for, from, the psych, from the anthropological point of view, uh, represents society's values. This relinquishment is, is uh, facilitated by the greater narcissistic need on the boy's part to preserve his masculinity, literally his penis, uh, greater, that is, than his Oedipal attachment to the mother. The resulting identification with the father and figure, the father, and internalization of his standards gives birth to the superego, which for this reason Freud described as heir to the Oedipus complex. To say that Oedipus complex, that the Oedipus complex is universal across cultures, does not mean that specific cultural and environmental circumstances don't influence or are, um, or are not very important determinants in how the Oedipus complex is manifested. In fact, Freud's own theory demands that these play a central determining role. What it does mean is that all cultures, that in all cultures, the Oedipus complex operates as a central organizing determinant not only for child development but also for the establishment of social structures, for example, um, kinship rules, residence patterns, as well as for cultural institutions, for example, religious beliefs, myths, rites of passage. All organized societies must have evolved institutionalized solutions for resolving the demands posed by the dynamic conflicts inherent in the Oedipus complex. In the full presentation of part one, I'll describe the great deal of new evidence from anthropology since Freud published Totem and Taboo over a hundred years ago to support this assertion. As Melford Spiro, 
concluded in his landmark anthropological analysis, Oedipus in the Trobrians, the only appropriate, uh, says, the only appropriate response to the question, is the Oedipus complex universal, is how could it possibly not be? Okay, so on to Freud's theory of the primal horde. When assimilated to updated terminology and scientific evidence, Freud's controversial theory of the primal horde, in which he reconstructed the traumatic events leading to the creation of the first human society out of its earlier proto-human social organization, of the primal horde, is a surprisingly accurate depiction of early human cultural evolution and some of the critical functions of cultural institutions in general. In this account, Freud described the primal deed, the murder of the tyrannical leader or father of the horde, by the unified band of junior males or brothers of the horde in order to gain sexual access to the females whom the leader violently monopolized for himself. It turns out that this account is remarkably consistent with the latest scientific evidence. It also remains relevant to contemporary attempts to understand the nature of violence in human society. In this second part of the series, I'll rely heavily on the recent reappraisal of Freud's thesis by anthropologist psychoanalyst Robert Paul entitled, Yes, the Primal Crime Did Take Place, a further defense of Freud's Totem and Taboo, uh, published in, in 2010. Paul assimilates Freud's primal horde theory to recent evidence on primate social structures and hominid evolution. He demonstrates persuasively quote, that Freud's idea of the primal father can without much difficulty be assimilated to the concept of the alpha male at the apex of a status hierarchy such as that found among our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, that probably characterized the last common ancestor of the three African, African great apes and the hominin um, human line in evolution. End quote. In his conclusion, Paul describes the more favorable climate in contemporary anthropology for integrating social, cultural, biological, and psychological theory, and recommends that Freud's thesis in Totem and Taboo can serve as a basis for understanding both the foundational myths of our own culture as well as the evolution of human society more generally. So that's the primal horde. Lecture three on Freud's adherence to Lamarckian factors in evolution. Perhaps most controversially, recent advances in genetics and molecular biology may yet prove that Freud was correct in his insistence that human adaptive characteristics and variations acquired in the course of individual development can in some manner be inherited by an individual's offspring in subsequent generations. In other words, it is likely that some form of Lamarckian factor has operated in human evolution and remains a necessary part of a comprehensive theory of evolutionary adaptation. Freud was attacked as being wildly out of touch with modern genetics in his unshakable confidence that in some manner, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck had been correct. Even Freud's closest associates, such as Ernest Jones, attempted to talk him out of this when the opposing central dogma of modern genetic theory began to coalesce around the 1930s and the 1940s. Referred to as the modern synthesis, because it synthesized the rediscovered Mendelian genetics with Darwin's theories. The accepted model is often confused simply with Darwin's own theory of natural selection. In fact, the modern synthesis is called sometimes neo-Darwinian, 
partially because it threw out all the remnants of Lamarck's theory that even Darwin had considered to be valid. Currently, there's ample reason to believe that the model that has dominated, dominated evolutionary theory for much of the last century no longer, quote, no longer offers a satisfactory theoretical framework for evolutionary biology. This is a quote, end quote. This is a, a quote from Yablanka and Lamb as of 2008. Uh, geneticists. Many of the most prominent researchers in genetics and molecular biology are calling for a rethinking of the modern genetic model and a reconsideration of some aspects of Lamarckism for human evolution. To give just one example of this for the moment, here's what the senior investigator of the Evolutionary Genomics Research Group at the National Center for Biotechnology Information recently concluded. Quote, both Darwinian and Lamarckian modalities of evolution appear to be important and reflect different aspects of the interaction between populations and the environment. End quote. Uh, it's, it's very easy now to find many such examples of mainstream scientists making the same argument. In the presentation of this part three, this, this, this part of my lecture series on Freud's Lamarckism, I'll rely most heavily on the writings of the geneticist Eva Yelblanka and her co-authors, who have been among the leaders in this theoretical shift. Yablanka is most well-known for her research in epigenetics. As the prefix epi, meaning above, suggests, epigenetics refers to the biological mechanisms in all living organisms that are above the specific DNA sequences in chromosomes in the sense that they function as regulatory mechanisms or a regulatory system in relation to genes and genetic inheritance. There's now an abundance of evidence to show that alterations in epigenetic regulatory mechanisms that are acquired in the course of an individual's development, both during gestation and following birth, can be biologically inherited by that individual's offspring. It is clear, as Yoblanka puts it, that um, expressed variations in an organism, the phenotype, that are independent of variations in DNA sequence and that are guided by epigenetic control systems are important sources of hereditary variation and hence can contribute to evolutionary changes. Furthermore, under certain conditions, the mechanisms underlying epigenetic inheritance can also lead to saltational, this means atypical and very sudden, changes that reorganize the epigenome which is the uh, characteristic epigenetic features of a given organism or given species. These discoveries, she continues, are clearly incompatible with the tenets of the modern synthesis, which denied any significant role for Lamarckian and saltational, again, sudden and atypical processes, end quote. Uh, keep in mind that Darwin's theory and, um, but even more so, the modern uh, synthesis theory of evolution was that it took place only in very gradual change. Of particular relevance to totem and taboo, I will uh, be making a case for this in this part of the lecture are the findings by Yablanka and others for an increase in epigenetic influences on evolutionary variation during conditions of stress. I'll emphasize this in part three of the series, and the fact that Freud's evolutionary theory in Totem and Taboo is a trauma theory, specifically a theory about the transgenerational transmission of trauma, spelled out in the context of the primal horde. It's only too easy to forget that Freud's account of the primal horde assumed the effects, or presumed, in a sense, the effects 
of multiple traumatic events. Beyond, of course, the father's own trauma while being murdered, we have to include all the pre-deed traumas associated with violence, castration, whether literal castration or a kind of psychological castration, um, and sexual assault entailed in the primitive dominant system of male competition for sexual access to the women of the horde. We'd include the traumatic effects upon the members of the horde sustained during the actual overcoming, killing, and eating of the primal father. Uh, the trauma, the traumatic quality of these actions would have been assured at the very least by the loving side of the ambivalence that the members of the horde felt for the primal father. Also included would be the passive witnessing of any of the events just mentioned by helpless bystanders, women and children of the horde, and especially those most emotionally attached to the victims, including the victim, the, the, the primal father. Finally, we'd have to include trauma sustained in the chaotic aftermath of the murder of the leader, who despite his tyranny, had provided necessary protection from external dangers, had functioned as the most important structural feature or figure for the group's stability, and whose dominance and possession of the females rendered competitive aggression between the junior males relatively unnecessary. In other words, he, the, 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 the uh, dominance of the primal father kept violence within the horde at a relative minimum. It's in light of these considerations, in connection with the fact that Freud's account is simultaneously a theory of evolutionary adap adaptation and a theory of trauma, that the following observation by Yablanka on the special causal role of stress, trauma in this case, in the generation of epigenetic variations becomes especially interesting and relevant to Freud's theory and relevant to the argument that I'm going to be making on Freud's behalf. Yablanka states, what has been revealed in the last few decades is that the origin of many genetic variations especially under conditions of stress, is not random, is often predictable, and can result in atypical and sudden, again, saltational changes. The genome-wide changes are driven by the epigenetic control mechanisms that under normal environmental conditions operate in a more limited, limited and specific manner. Um, this, to me, is a fascinating discovery. And it's perfectly consistent with Freud's conclusion in Totem and Taboo that the major evolutionary shift from proto-human to human society, in Freud's terms, the shift from primal horde to uh, the structures of totemic society, was intimately associated with adaptive solutions to multiple traumatic events. Keeping in mind also that although Freud, um, his depiction in Totem and Taboo uh, was as if this took place once, this murder of the primal father and the subsequent aftermath of that, but really what he um, uh, conceptualized was uh, a, dynamic, uh, a dynamic series of events that probably took place over thousands of years, many, many generations. Okay, lecture four on Freud's cultural evolutionary approach. Finally, in the last part four presentation, I'll make the case for the, validity, for the validity of Freud's use of 19th century cultural evolutionary concepts. His synthesis of clinical observations and ethnographic findings using a general comparative method in order to reconstruct stages in human cultural evolution 
is not only justified, but remains so in spite of the wild, widely accepted critiques of 19th century cultural evolutionism. Many of the once disparaged concepts that Freud employed in common with the earlier evolutionary anthropologists remain valid today when properly integrated with contemporary approaches, contemporary terminology, and scientific evidence. This would include Freud's use of E.B. Tyler's doctrine of psychological and cultural survivals, um, outdated remnants of archaic uh, stages of social cultural evolution that show up in current society. The general concept of human nature and the corollary concepts of cross-cultural universals and psychic unity, or the similarity of the human mind across cultures, all of these concepts began to be um, partially criticized in the first half of the 20th century. Still are in, in many respects. The earliest 20th century critics of cultural evolutionism such as modern American anthropology founder Franz Boas, still retained, along with Freud, something of a conventional scientific philosophy. Generally speaking, they upheld the necessity of formulating general principles or hypotheses or general laws that could be then tested against further observation and applied cross-culturally. This all began to change quite rapidly. In American anthropology, where evolutionary theory and the idea of psychic unity declined quickly, ever more radical versions of cultural determinism and cultural relativism were put forward to argue that cultures not only differed, but they differed radically. The more radical expressions of this stance allowed for no scientific or generalizable standards of measurement comparison or understanding across cultures. In other words, culture itself as a concept can't be understood scientifically or framed scientifically. Only particular cultures can be understood and each must be studied and understood only in terms of its own culturally relative frame of reference. Here's Ruth Benedict's statement of this made as early as 1934 in Patterns of Culture, perhaps one of the most popular and most published books in all of, um, in all of the history of anthropology. Quote, culture, cultures differ from one another not only because one trait is present here and absent, absent there, and because another trait is found in two regions in two different forms, they differ still more because they are oriented as wholes in different directions. They are traveling along different roads in pursuit of different ends. And these ends and these means in one society cannot be judged in terms of those of another society because they are essentially incommensurable. This idea of incommensurability um, is, is this idea that there is no general statement that can be applied cross-culturally. By the 1950s, this relativist position and the more radical versions of it had been adopted by the psychoanalysts Fromm and Horney, as well as by the school Culture and Personality led by Cardner. That was a quote by um, Smaja. Unfortunately, psychoanalysis is still quite entrenched in the more radical versions of this. In spite of the fact that already by mid-century anthropology had begun to see its flaws, and the problems with the more radical versions of cultural relativism involved some of the most relevant concerns not only for psychoanalysis, but for psychology and theories of mental health in general. As an example, in 1961, Milton Singer, the anthropologist, uh, Milton Singer from the University of Chicago, would already report, the collection of psychiatric data from other cultures is still far from adequate 
but what there is has not yet revealed startling differences in abnormal human tendencies. Um, this was a, um, uh, a strong statement against uh, and an indictment of a radical cultural relativist position. Okay, so those are the four major themes that I'm going to cover in the next four lectures. Now I want to say um, a bit in order to provide some brief context regarding the history and quality of the debates over these four most controversial aspects of Freud's anthropology. First, on the irony in the major critiques of Freud's anthropology. In my defense of Freud's anthropology, I hope to illustrate a recurring irony that's run throughout the entire history of the debates between psychoanalysis and anthropology over Freud's conclusions. As we saw simply from Milton Singer's observation in the last summary of Part 4, some of the most compelling evidence for Freud's theories has come precisely from those who have been his most ardent critics. In my reading of the literature, this has occurred, this ironic fact that much of the evidence against Freud's, or on behalf of Freud's argument, has come from his own critics. My reading of the literature is that this has occurred in three main ways. First, as in the fog of war, it has come in the form of crossfire aimed initially at Freud, but then hitting other critics on the opposite side of an all-or-nothing argument being directed at him. Second, it has occurred when the ethnographic data marshaled against Freud unwittingly undermined the critic's own position and reinforced Freud's theory. And third, it has come in the form of advances in research and theory in anthropology and other disciplines that have had some stake in the questions Freud addressed in Totem and Taboo. This last reason is particularly true for anthropology, which if it attacked Freud um, the most, it also engaged with Freud's theories more than any other discipline and took the greatest interest in putting them to the test. On the unique quality of Freud's anthropological hypotheses, it's interesting to, uh, to consider that Freud's anthropological theories are unique in his collected writings and that he never altered them once they were formulated in Totem and Taboo and later. In these theories on evolution, culture, and society, there was nothing comparable to the revisions that Freud never stopped making in his better-known psychological theories, such as his abandonment of the seduction theory or his redefinition of the dual instincts to Eros and Thanatos, um, his redefinition of anxiety. He was constantly revising and um, thinking critically about his psychological theories and changing and, and building on them. In fact, Freud only became more firm in his anthropological conclusions once he asserted them, even depending on them for the working out of his other psychological and metapsychological concepts. Only a year after writing Totem and Taboo, for example, Freud was already applying the concepts of archaic survivals and magic to his new theory on narcissism, in 1914. In his anthropological theory, the murder of the primal father and the origins of totemism become the evolutionary prototype of the resolution of the Oedipus complex for individual development. And these formulations will show up in his elaboration of the id, the ego, and the superego in his structural theory in 1923. In his last major work, Moses and Monotheism from 1939, year of his death, he reapplied the primal horde theory to a history of the Israelites, the murder of Moses, and the founding of Judaism. This confidence, in, this confidence that Freud maintained in his anthropological conclusions once he first published them 
It is particularly interesting given the fact that by his own account, they were among the most speculative of all his published works. Freud did, did venture even bolder evolutionary speculations in which he correlated the neurotic and psychotic disorders with corresponding stages in human evolution, but he considered these, quote, hardly suitable for public expression, end quote. For this reason, they were only discovered uh, long after his death um, in the 80s and published in 1987 as a phylogenetic fantasy ever overview of the transference neuroses. In any case, they were never a focus of the debates that, that concern us here. Revisions to Freud's anthropology. As we'll see in the remaining lectures, revisions were made to Freud's anthropology, but these came from others and mostly involved watered-down versions that threw out Freud's theory, threw out um, Freud's theory of, of its evolutionary focus. The most well-known of these were the Neo-Freudian integrations such as Abram, Abram Cardner's with the culture and personality theorists in anthropology. Integrations by others that remain true to the evolutionary project that Freud initiated in Totem and Taboo were rare. Exceptions, however, can be found in the writings of Freud's earlier followers, such as Otto Ronck's The Incest Motif in Myth and Literature, 1912, and Sandra Ferenzi's Thalassa, A Theory of Genitality, from 1924. Frenzy's work was perhaps the boldest in taking up Freud's evolutionary project, but it was all but ignored by anthropology, if not also by most psychoanalysts. I doubt that most psychoanalysts would even recognize the title of that, that interesting book. There also was the faithful ontogenetic or developmental approach worked out by uh, Geza Rohan, who was the first true psychoanalyst anthropologist. His application of Freud's psychosexual stages to the study of ritual practices and beliefs in different cultures was brilliant and extensive, but for non-analytically trained anthropologists, it remained inaccessible for the most part. In any case, Roheim himself rejected Freud's Lamarckian assertion that adaptive characteristics acquired during the course of an individual's development could be inherited. And Hartman, Chris, and Lowenstein in 1951, representing American ego psychology, would concur in their tribute to Roheim that, quote, we do not find it necessary to stress as much as Freud the hereditary elements in the formation of the Oedipus complex, unquote. They agreed with Roheim that, quote, many features that suggested to Freud a phylogenetic or evolutionary explanation can be accounted for by ontogenetic or developmental factors, end quote. In other words, by the 1950s, Freud's essential evolutionary conclusions in Totem and Taboo had already become somewhat taboo, even in mainstream psychoanalysis. Finally, on reappraisals and new evidence in favor of Freud's anthropology. On the other hand, in spite of downplaying Freud's hereditary argument, Hartman, Chris, and Lowenstein were nonetheless careful to point out the remarkable fact that, quote, strictly speaking, Freud's Lamarckian assumptions were not invalidated by modern biological studies. I consider this to be a remarkably um, um, perceptive observation made at that time, and as we'll see in the fourth lecture, recent evidence from biology and genetics support it. In anthropology, renewed interest in evolutionary theories began to take place around the 1950s and 1960s, and signs of a revival of totem and taboo came increasingly in the 1970s and 1980s, again in anthropology, not in psychoanalysis. In 
Reappraisals like Paul's, Robert Paul's, first essay on the subject, Did the Primal Crime Take Place in 1976, Robin Fox's The Red Lamp of Incest in 1980, and Melford Spiro's Oedipus in the Trogrins in 1982 resurrected Freud's anthropology for legitimate scholarly attention. In particular, Spiro's analysis demolished Bronislav Malinowski's long-standing case against the universal Oedipus complex made in Sex and Repression in Savage Society in 1927. That, was the, that, that has been and was the single most important critique of Freud's um, totem and taboo, but specifically the critique of uh, Freud's claim for universality of the Oedipus complex. Sex and Repression in Savage Society by Malinowski. For 50 years, Malinowski's critique had gone unchallenged within anthropology. For 50 years, not a single serious critique of it. And even from, and, uh, on the other hand, even from psychoanalytic psychiatry, Edwin Wallace's brilliant Freud and Anthropology, A History and Repri Reprisal in 1983, offered a far more nuanced assessment of Freud's anthropology, as well as of previous critiques. An, indica an indication that this trend within anthropology, this um, revival of Freud's anthropological theory, an indication that it's continued into the present day can be seen in the title of Robert Paul's second reappraisal, Yes, the Primal Crime Did Take Place, a further defense and Freud a further defense of Freud's totem and taboo in 2010. Forty years have passed since Paul wrote Did the Primal Scene Take Place, and he's even more convinced today about the validity of Freud's thesis. This is from Anthropology. In the next four parts of this lecture series, I'll return frequently to the writings of both Paul and Melford Spiro, as I believe that they've been particularly helpful from the side of anthropology and bringing to light the value of Freud's own anthropological theory in relation to contemporary research. So that concludes my introduction to the series of lectures on Freud's anthropological theory and the claim that he was right. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll begin uh, with a fuller exposition of uh, my argument on behalf of Freud's claim for the universal Oedipus complex. Thank you very much. Thank you.